Alrighty everybody, how's it going? Ben Gothard here with another Project Egg interview and today we are talking to the wonderful Dima Gawi from Jordan. How are you doing today, Dima? Hi, how are you? Great, fantastic. Thank you so much for jumping on the interview. I really do appreciate your time. So I want to just jump right in uh, and ask you the first question, which is what is your story? My story is um, I'm originally from the Middle East. I was raised in Jordan, and my story mainly started when I was five years old, when my grandmother held a glass vase, and she said, do you see this perfect glass vase? A girl is just like it. It needs to be perfect, and any cracks in the vase uh, means that that's the vase we throw in the trash, and no one would want it. We can't glue it. We cannot fix it. So that what my, what my grandmother was mainly saying is, that a Middle Eastern girl needs to be uh, perfect and any crack, any mistake she does, that's going to be negatively perceived in the community and no one would want her. And my story is living all my life as the perfect last phase and following and obeying and doing what my culture expected of me, but in the process, losing myself and having no identity, having no voice. And, um, uh, the, really the journey that I had to go through to shatter the vase and discover who I am and give myself permission to create a new story beyond all of these cultural expectations and community expectations and where it helped me transform from a person with no uh, purpose, no identity, no voice to a person who I am now that I'm speaking around the world, teaching individuals how to advance in business and leadership and um, teaching so many people about shattering their own limitations, the external and the internal. So this is an overall summary of my story. That's incredible. That's incredible. So, you know, I want to go back to, to very early on. Um, you, you were saying how your grandmother was showing you that vase and, and you know, how it was kind of symbolic of, of how, you know, ladies needed to be perfect. Um, how, how do you think that that originally um, impacted who you were as a person. And, and maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. Hmm. And in, in initially, um, I wanted to be accepted and I wanted to be loved. So as a result, in order to be part of the community, I had to follow and obey. And as a result, I was taught not to, I, I did, I, I didn't have, I didn't voice my opinion. I was so quiet, so shy. And I realized that Everybody around me were living with vases. Everybody was following and obeying as well, whether it is my mom, my grandmother, even my, my father and my, my, uh, cu my uncles and cousins. It just seems that all of it created a culture of not having an individuality or an opinion. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a, gr a lot of followers, and we just got used to being that. And I was, I was that. I didn't know any better, right? Like when you're living in a culture like this, you just do what you're observing everybody else around you is doing. And you think that this is the norm and you think that it is okay. But the challenge is when in my situation, I started opening my eyes and I realizing, well, I'm not happy. Like I am loved. I am, I am being accepted, but I'm so miserable. And I didn't know why I was miserable. I got into depression and I didn't know why I was in depression. Now, back and I know exactly why I lost myself I wasn't living a life that was my choice and I was um, doing everything that others were happy with and I was perfect and perfection comes with a price and the price is losing ourselves and that's where I was wow that's powerful so so I, I want you to take us through uh, kind of the timeline of you know, you going through through school and, and, you know, how you kind of developed this idea of, you know, maybe I don't have to abide by these rules. Maybe I don't have to, to obey. So can you take us through that timeline of growing up and, and really how you struggled with it and then eventually overcame it? Right. Yes. I gave you initially the very, very high level summary. So I'll dig into details now. Uh, the way it worked is I, I continued to hear more of these stories about uh, being, following and obeying. And I, when I was 19, I got engaged to the most eligible bachelor in our community. And my parents were so excited. Um, I 
he was uh, he is 10 years older than me. And at that time, I was open to this opportunity because this is what I was raised to that my to get married and have to clean and cook and do all of these things that is that are expected of me as uh, as the one and we got married when i was 20 and we moved to uh, san diego uh, to follow his career aspirations he's a jeweler and he had a, a a big business in jordan and he decided he wants to start a jewelry manufacturing company in san diego and i thought that with the move to the us and by being allowed to discover who i am like uh, by moving to the us and being in this amazing uh, culture and country and the freedom that I hear about and the movies that I watched on TV about the U.S. I thought that I'll, I'll be accepted for who I was and I would be allowed to discover my identity and to grow. And I was shocked from the beginning to realize that it wasn't the case, as if my vase moved with me from Jordan to, to San Diego. And I was expected to continue to follow, obey, uh, not to have any any personality, no opinion. I wasn't allowed to do like simple things. Like I wasn't allowed to have friends. I wasn't allowed to speak to my mom in Jordan more than 20 minutes uh, a week. And uh, I wasn't allowed to leave without asking for permission. And I, it just it was just so, so tough. And initially I accepted all of this because again, I didn't know any better. That was the life that I was raised to believe is the norm. Uh, but one of the things I did was that I insisted to work on my bachelor's. And uh, that was my con only condition for the marriage, that I would be allowed to work on my bachelor's. And I uh, enrolled at San Diego State University. So as I was going to school and I would be sitting in the classroom or walking on campus, I would see all of like the students and how free they looked and how the way they were dressed was different. The way they walked was different than me. They were not as, uh, they didn't seem to be so suppressed as I was. And I would be looking at them and I would be like, wow, I just want to be like them. I want to, uh, even in the classroom, they would share their opinion and they would answer questions and I would be so shy and I would be hiding from all of this. So that's when really my eyes started opening up and I'm, and I'm thinking, wow, there's a whole different life. There's things that I want in my life. And when I started questioning, uh, when I started trying to change, that's when started a major conflict started happening in the marriage because I was not expected to, to be like that. Um, even though uh, my, my husband at that time, he was so open-minded and Western thinking. He, he studied in the U.S. and graduated in the U.S., even though he was very different than the average Arab man that I'm used to. But somehow the basic uh, expectations and uh, the sense of perfection was a big part of our marriage and the roles of what a man and what a, what a woman has to do. So um, I got into depression. I was 24 years old and I just didn't understand it at that time. I didn't know why I was in such a deep depression. And um, I continued to type even though I wasn't happy. I remember uh, calling my mom one day in Jordan and saying, I'm just so miserable. Like I, I cannot stay in this marriage. And my mom said like this, don't even consider that. That's not an option. Just stay in that marriage and you will be okay. Like eventually, like figure out what will make your husband happy and you'll be okay. But then I just couldn't. I just felt, I just continued to feel miserable. And a few months later, I got terribly depressed. And I remember waking up one day, just staring at the wall, at the ceiling all day long. And I called in sick. I didn't go to work. And I just, just, I just didn't know what to do. I knew I couldn't stay and I knew I couldn't leave. I couldn't leave because that would that would mean that I cracked the vase. That means that I smashed it and that's not going to be acceptable. And I knew that there would be consequences, that my father would not be happy, that there would be uh, community um, gossip and a lot of things that I don't want to deal with. But I couldn't stay because I continued to lose myself. And my intuition just kept telling me that, take action, leave, take action. And it, it, I was just stuck in the middle. Like I couldn't stay, I couldn't leave. It was not a good place at all. Um, and then eventually that day I packed and I left at the end of the day. And I knew, I went to bed and I knew that I cracked the vase and I knew that it's not gonna, uh, it's not gonna be good. So I got, um, I was living in a one bedroom apartment in a very, very uh, not good area in, in an area in San Diego called Poway. 
Um, it's low income. There were there was a lot of issues in the area, but I just needed to give myself the opportunity to to give myself a chance of a better life. And the first thing that I did was I decided to work on my master's. So I enrolled at the University of San Diego. So here I was working on my master's, but on my personal life, even though I knew that consequences would be horrible, I didn't realize how really horrible they would get to be. So my father started threatening uh, initially that he's going to disobey me, disown me, and he doesn't want me anymore. But then he started threatening to kill me. And I've been living, now it's been 16 years, I've been living with death threats, and it's called honor killing, where if a woman does something that her father or her um, brother disagree with in countries, like specific countries, they they uh, kill the woman. They believe that shedding her blood bring honor back to the family. And um, and then, then they the person who killed her, the father or the brother, goes to prison for a couple of months and they leave and they there's a big celebration around them because they uh, they're considered that they restored the family honor. And the only reason I'm alive for 16 years is because my father is in uh, Jordan and I'm in San Diego. He doesn't, or now I'm in Louisiana, but at that time, he doesn't speak English very well and he doesn't know how to navigate and he doesn't have network here to help them to, <laughs> to, to finish off my life. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, that's the only reason I'm alive. But as I was going, experiencing all of this, I realized that the only way to move forward and discover my identity is through education. And that's why I enrolled at the University of San Diego to work on my master's. I did that because I wanted hope. I needed a sense that there's something better in my life than what I have been experiencing. And I wanted, of course, to be able to uh, get a better job and make more money and learn and all of these things. There's a phrase in the Middle East, it's called, it's in Arabic, al-ilm al-nur wa jahlu dhalam, which means knowledge is light and ignorance is darkness. So when we are knowledgeable, when we're educated, when we know who we are, we're not going to live with the vase, which is the dark. It's only with ignorance, when there is no education, no self-awareness. That's when people become, they live in the dark and they think they have no choice. But really, we, we have a choice and there are going to be consequences. There's going to be uh, challenges. But at the end, we we get to have a better life. We give ourselves a chance. We're giving the next generation a chance. And by going to doing my master's, I was able to apply and I got a job with IBM. I got to travel around the world, manage global teams, um, do things that I never ever imagined that I would be able to do. And of course, there I had to go through major healing for years to because of all of this pain and the heartbreak and even though I was okay externally, I looked right. I was dressed like everybody else, but internally I was heartbroken. I was I was bleeding inside with all of the um, sadness and the fear and the worry about the future. Um, and this is a process. It doesn't. It never goes away. Um, but it is. It's a healing process that I had to go through. So two years ago, I decided to resign from the corporate world after working for IBM for 11 years. And after experiencing wonderful things, and I started my own company focused on the talent development, helping individuals become better leaders, helping them discover their limitations and shatter these limitations. And now I'm even doing deeper stuff of helping individuals with their transition because I had to go through multiple personal and professional transitions. And now this is the newest thing because there's so many people in this world right now they are going through a transition, but they don't understand it. They, they're they just not satisfied. They're not happy. They may be making great income. They may be have achieved the image of success that they believed they wanted. Like they have the house and the car and the spouse and the kids, but they're still empty and they feel they lost their identity in the process. So this is my new thing, which is working with these individuals and helping them identify what is their purpose and what, what are they supposed to, what is the meaning in their life and how to connect more with it. That is incredible. That is absolutely incredible. Um, wow. So, so I want to, I want to kind of take a step back, uh, and, and really, really pick through this. Um, <clears throat> so you said that at 19, you got engaged and you moved to San Diego. Um, 
so your your image of of that that vase, right? And and that's a very powerful analogy. So I want to keep coming back to it. Um, but but that image of the vase, at 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 what point was it? Um, at that time, because you know you had you had the the idea of it starting when you were five that your grandma had shown you. Um, how had it shifted? at that point? Was it, was it different? Did it make some sort of transition at that point? Um, and, and if so, how, how exactly did that influence your, your day-to-day -day decisions? You know, how, mm -hmm. really, how did that impact you at, at that specific point? Right. So the base uh, transitioned with me. It was the same exact base. So, and of course it is a metaphor. So it wasn't like a vase that I moved from Jordan to, to San Diego, but it was my identity and it, it was what was expected of me. And anytime I would challenge or question, that's when there would be a threat to the perfection or the image that I was supposed to keep. So, uh, and you know, in many situations we live with stories and we live with lies and we don't even know that they're lies. We don't know that they're stories that don't serve us. But in my life, that was what I was born to believe. That was my identity and I had to protect it. I had to be perfect. I had to obey and follow and do things so I would be accepted by my family and community. Like really, who would want to be rejected? And, um, and as a result, to be accepted, I had to lose myself in the process. So moving to the U.S., I feel that the same vase, the same expectations moved with me. And I was living in a small uh, Jordanian community. So people knew each other. They're related. They, they, we spend the holidays together. We spend every weekend together. Uh, we, we speak in Arabic. We're cooking Arabic. We're inviting people get married within the same community. So I call it the little Middle East. So even though I was living in this amazing San Diego and the beautiful, like everything about it. But I was still limited to a certain expectations and a certain community that I had to stay uh, confined by. And when you think about a lot of the communities that moved to the US, even though we talk about the melting pot, but in reality, a lot of the traditional cultures, they want to maintain their culture. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like I love cultures. I love, I love learning about cultures and I don't think we need to melt them. But at the same time, there's certain things about the cultures that need to change. So let's keep the culture. Let's keep our dance and the music and the food and the love and the community. But let's help people have their own identity within that culture. Just the fact that we want to belong, it doesn't, doesn't mean that we have to sacrifice our own self. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah. I want to I talk a little bit about uh, how you got into college and, and how you were getting your bachelor's. Uh, first of all, what did you study? Um, economics. <laughs> economics. Okay, fantastic. Um, and again, you, you said that that was kind of the point that you really started questioning um, the vase and, and you really started thinking about things in, an, in a different way. So how did those, how did those questions, if you will, those, those uh, second thoughts, how did they start appearing you know how how did you start realizing like wow this is not how it has to be how, how did that manifest itself in, in your life right so uh, to go back to your initial question economics and the reason I picked economics even though there was like so many other majors is my uncle uh, has a PhD in economics so and I wanted to be like my uncle so that by itself shows that I was so uh, I was following what other person, their footsteps was, and I didn't open myself to all of these amazing opportunities. That's when there was a lot of things related to internet. So it was in 2000, 1996. So when we talk about internet and graphic design, that's when all of that was starting. But I didn't even open myself to that. I just kept going the traditional way. Um, the, the, re the way it started questioning is, like, I would question what, and now it's difficult to go back and think about like how I started questioning. That's interesting. Like I would question um, even like the religion. I was raised Christian, even even though I was raised in an Islamic country. But I would start questioning like why do we believe certain things? Uh, why why uh, why should I do why why should I go to church every Sunday? Uh, why are this person who is speaking the the 
priest? Why, why should we follow what he's saying? I would question like, why am I the person supposed to be shopping and cooking and cleaning all the time? Why isn't my husband helping with these things? So it's like the simple roles. So I started questioning them and that was like a major threat. Like, are, are you kidding? That is your responsibility. You are the wife. And those are like simple things. But it's interesting when when I started like even considering for the first time that, well, maybe I need help. Maybe maybe I do need uh I, I need uh, to question them. The reaction was so intense as well and was not uh, was not pleasant at all. And when we get reaction like this, that's when we start questioning more. So it's either we suppress it and we accept it, or we're like, oh, there's there's I'm not okay with that. Um, so it's just like it started with simple little things. Um, one one time we had a a lot of ants. Like we had we came home and there were like tons of ants all over the kitchen. They appeared within like a couple of hours, and uh, and my I remember my ex husband he he's like oh there's tons of ants in the kitchen and he went to watch TV he put put the the uh, he took the remote put the TV on and sat on his couch and he sat to watch the TV and I'm like why am I the one who has to clean the ants so it's like silly simple things like this but those this is how it started where I'm questioning like why me. Why is your role a certain way? Why is my role a certain way? At that time, I wanted to work on my MBA and he, I was not allowed. Why am I not allowed to continue my education? Why am I not allowed to have friends? Why am I not allowed to speak to my mom more than 20 minutes a week? So like even those simple things, initially I took them for granted and those are the rules I had to live with. But then when I started watching people around me, the students, uh, watching how they work, I wasn't allowed to uh, when I was going to school to work at that time. So why can they work and have income and go to school while I'm not allowed to? So it's just like all of these simple things. And even though they seem like silly right now, but they were a big deal because that was my life at that time. And I didn't even have a choice with the simplest, simplest thing to, to make a decision for my own life. Wow. Wow. So you know, when it comes to that sort of questioning and really starting to to break out of that that same cycle, um, I'm sure there are a lot, a lot of people who may still be stuck in in that same you know that same situation, and they may not be either strong enough or they just may not know how to break out of it. So, yeah. coming from somebody who has already done it, what advice can you offer to those people? And, and, you know, it may not be that specific situation. It may be that they're stuck in a nine to five that they hate. It may be that, you know, kind of like you, they, they were in a marriage that they weren't happy with or, or maybe there was a cultural barrier. But whatever it is that they are stuck in, what advice can you give them to break out of that, to, to, yeah. to, to completely just break free? Mm. Just the fact that they feel not satisfied that means that there's something bigger than them that is ready to, to happen. The challenge is many times we suppress it because with transformation, that requires change, that requires risk. Maybe we make mistakes. That requires digging deep and knowing who we are. And many of us, we don't even want to know who we are because that's scary. That requires uh, looking into our fears and insecurities and our childhood. So my, my advice to them is, if they are in a job that they're not happy with, if they're in a relationship that they're 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 just they're losing themselves in, I'm not saying leave today. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is just observe what you're feeling. What is your body telling you? What is your intuition telling you? What is what is the voice in your head? What is it repeating every day? If it's repeating a message that you need to drive change, listen to that. And it doesn't have to be immediate. It could take months and that's okay. It could take a year, but it's a matter of continuing to connect with our intuition. The intuition is the voice of our spirit. And when, when we're blocking it because of fear, we're disconnecting our body from our spirit and no one would want to be like that. So one, one of the stories I share is about my friend. I'll just call him Joe for now. Joe, he, um, when I started working for IBM, he, he was my team leader at that time, and he hated his job. He was doing it for many, many years before I joined, and he just hated it. And now it's been over a decade later, 
And guess what, what Joe is still doing? The same exact job, same responsibility, same everything. Um, so I, I worked for IBM for 11 years and now I'm out for, uh, for two. So that's like 13 years later, he's still doing a job that he's stuck with, but he's getting a salary. He's comfortable with the benefits. He is, uh, he, he's afraid that he would take a risk and he would always say, what if it is not greener out there? What if I'm going to, uh, what if I'm going to re uh, uh, what it was the word like, uh, um, be unhappy with this new with this new opportunity what if i'm going to look back and wish i stayed and this is the problem like i'm realizing now as i'm coaching people around the world we all have very similar things like this where we're ready to transition but we stay because we're comfortable with staying but we don't realize that by not taking action by not questioning or listening to our intuition we are losing ourselves and sometimes the price of staying is even higher than the price of taking a risk and moving on and uh, and that that's something we need to think about and it's part of like part of our growth we're not born to be in a certain linear way that a lot of people do it so you you you're born you go to school you graduate you go to college you work you get married you have kids and it's like linear and the same cycle starts again for the next generation. It's not supposed to be like that. There needs to be multiple stops of reflection and looking into, are, am I satisfied? Am I supposed to be doing something else? We may start in a one place and end in a whole different place. I started in a place in Jordan, in the Middle East, being uh, a woman with no voice. And now I'm speaking to thousands at speeches. And it's just a matter of realizing the opportunity, building a dream and transitioning to it. So the answer, if there's one thing I, I recommend for them to do is to just listen. Listen to yourself because we know the answers. We just shut them down. And we're so busy with life, busy raising kids, busy getting the projects done. And uh, we, end up, we end up waking up one day when we're 100 years old and saying, oh, what happened? Like, where did my life go? And most likely saying, I wish if I got the chance to do things differently, I would do it very, very differently. Think about it. Like if you wake up and you're 100 years old, would you tell yourself, stay safe and don't take risks and just be, be like everybody else? Or would you tell yourself, take risks, believe in yourself, challenge yourself, challenge people around you? Which one would you do? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a great point. So, you know, you mentioned something that I thought was really interesting. Um, you said that, you know, one of the things that people who are stuck in, in that uh, situation need to do is listen to their intuition. Um, and you also said that, that now you really help people find their purpose um, and, and really help them with that. Um, how are those two related? And kind of a second part question to that is, how do we pick through what is the fear what is the, the old mentality and what is that new raw intuition and, and, and purpose? Mm, right. Okay, so let's answer one question at a time. The first one is about the linking, linking the intuition with our purpose. In my situation, so what I mentioned that our intuition is the voice of our soul and there's no separation between our soul and our purpose. So our intuition, this voice in our head is telling us, I want to start a new business. I want I want to resign from this and, and do something totally different. I want to get out of this horrible, abusive marriage. All of that, that's our intuition. That's our spirit speaking to us. And it is very much linked to our purpose because when, when we listen to it, it's going to guide us. It's going to guide us into a path to help us reach a different place. And, uh, and I think about it. So think about you are here. And where you're supposed to be is a whole different place, so a different island. And you have to take a bridge to cross from one island to another island. And underneath it, there's like this huge river that is so scary. And you don't want to fall in the river. And you have to take the bridge step by step. But as you're crossing the bridge, you're going to be challenged. You're going to face fears. You're going to have most likely memories from the past. You're going to have uh, stories and things that uh, you were told of how you should act and how you should behave. But there's no way for you to cross to the other other side unless if you have to 
deal with those things. You have to process them. And that's when your intuition comes in play because your intuition is guiding you through it. It's, it's healing you through the journey as well. So they're very linked. And many people, they feel bad and they say, well, I don't have a purpose. I, I don't want to be the speaker standing on the stage and speaking to all of these people. But we all have a purpose. Maybe their purpose is to create, to raise the next generation of healthy children. Maybe their purpose is to do such an amazing job for their company to help it grow. So it doesn't have to be, a purpose doesn't have to be this like major thing where you have to quit your job and um, change the world. It doesn't have to be that. Just having a positive day every day, influencing people, maybe giving $2 to uh, somebody who's homeless, that could be part of our purpose. So it, it has so much to it. It doesn't have to be huge. It could be small little things. And we just need to continue to listen. Uh, so that's the first question. The second question was about fear. Like how do you differ differentiate your what, your voice of fear compared to the voice of, what was it? What was the second part? The That voice of intuition. How do we pick, yeah. how do we pick apart and, and really know which one to follow? The one that gives you energy, that means it's your intuition. The one that makes you feel down and feel that you're not good enough and create and make you get a sense that you're uh, uh, like question your abilities, that is fear. Um, so many, many times, like when we do things, even though they are scary, but they're, if they're aligned with our intuition, they give us energy, they fuel us, they make us more interested and curious and wanting wanting to learn and and it, the journey is definitely not easy and there's going to be a lot of things we have to face with it but at the same time we're growing so the voice that helps to challenge you that's the intuition the voice that's telling you well there's so many better people out there or what if you fail what if you lose your money how you're going to survive what are people going to think about you well definitely that's not intuition that's the other one. Um, and that is the voice of fear, the voice of judgment, the voice of perfection, where so many people, they just want to be perfect and they want to put this perfect mask that that gives an image to the world so different than what is rottening inside. Um, well, that's a voice of fear. So like when I, the day that changed my life, when I decided to leave, my intuition was telling me, feel the fear, take action, give yourself a chance you deserve so much better than that. There's going to be better opportunities coming your way. So that is one voice. The other voice was like, who do you think you are? You're going to mess our family. You're, gonna, you're, you're, you're going to be rejected. You're going to shatter this vase. You're going to do everything that is not accepted by our family. You're going to fail. You're going to go back and beg for forgiveness. That is the voice of fear. And it's a balance. You know, the cartoons when we were little kids, the cartoon of the angel and the devil. It's a balance between the two of them. The, the voice of fear has protecting, protected us. It doesn't have to be that it is evil. It's not. It has protected us and helped us be more careful. So we wouldn't just go crazy and do all kinds of things. But at the same time, we need the angel to, we need to connect with the voice of the angel, the intuition that is, uh, yeah, telling us that we're worth it and we're good enough the way we are and we deserve the best and uh, there's so many opportunities and things to experience and we should be part of all of that. Uh, we, we, need, we need to listen to it and recognize it. Wow, that, that's powerful. That's strong. Um, so, okay, so I want to keep going. Um, you mentioned how at, at 24 you are talking about the day that, that really changed everything when you left. Um, and how you moved into that one-bedroom apartment in the not-so-nice area of San Diego. Um, how long from when you left until you started your master's? Uh, and mm. what was that? How did that uh, chronology uh, take place? Okay. Well, something happened in between that I'll share and I'll, I'll tell you. So I left in on uh, April 15th. Uh, 2001. So it was on tax day. <laughs> uh, it was Easter day too. So I call it, it's my day of resurrection. I, I survived. I had, I created a new life that day. But when I talk about the death threats that I started facing, it wasn't just me. Uh, my, my father started becoming very abusive for my mom and my sister as well in Jordan and um, physically abusive. And he started threatening to, to end their life as well. 
he the concept that his daughter uh, me getting getting a divorce was beyond what he could handle because his image in the community would not allow him would not be it's not okay for him to be considered as a dad with a daughter who's divorced in the u.s it is like people get divorced people get married get divorced in the community that i was raised in that was so unacceptable especially for a woman to leave that's like beyond shameful so as a result, because of my mom and my sister, we had to have them escape from Jordan. And uh, that was intense. So my sister was 17. My mom was 49. And I was, uh, at that time, 25. So when they escaped, it was um, August. So between April, things really fell apart, end of June. And uh, by August, we had to have them escape from Jordan. So talk about, like, fear of somebody like my mom and my sister leaving everything behind. They left with a small suitcase that had like stuff for a day or two. Um, and leaving the investment, my mom had to leave my her home, had to leave her job, had to leave her friends, had to leave everything behind. So when we talk about like the, the fear of loss, my mom continues to live with the fear of loss because she had to experience living through it and my sister had to leave everything behind she was uh 17 and it hurt, broke her heart to leave her teddy bears and uh, the bears she got from her friends with the with the heart on it like these are simple things but those become our identity this is the life that we're comfortable with but it got to a point where their life was at risk from my own father from my like my mom from her husband and my sister from her father and uh that that was a mess so when I, um, when I learned about all of the horrible things that were going on in the Middle East, uh, you would think that I would sit and I would just be crippled and be like, oh my God, my world is ending. I felt that, that like that, of course. But I, I, that's when I started studying for my GMAT. That's when it gave me the energy that I was like, I'm going to work on my master's and I'm going to graduate and I'm going to create a better life. And it is, maybe it was an escape. Maybe it was a sense of hope. So in order for me to get into my master's, I had to, to pass or get a good grade in the GMAT. So the day when my mom and my sister were flying from Jordan right after they escaped, which we don't know if they're going to even make it to, to the U.S., I took my first uh, GMAT exam. How crazy is that? But to me, I felt that it, I was escaping, escaping the reality and giving myself a hope that things will get better. And I wanted to see, I wanted to create the light at the end of the tunnel. It wasn't there, but I wanted to create it uh, against all of the obstacles that we were facing. So I didn't do well at all. I got a horrible grade, but then my mom and sister came. And then I, I want to say like six months later, I uh, retook it. I did better. And then the following year, that's when I uh, started with my MBA. So it's, it's so much bigger because when I talk about shattering the vase, my, sh my shatter created this horrible vibration that shattered my mom's vase, my sister's vase, so women in our family and with ourselves. Like the three of us trying to survive, um, we had no identity, we had no voice, we had uh, no self-worth, um, but we had to figure out a way to, to stick together and to continue to survive. And of course, like the ending of the story where we are right now, it's a good place. Like I am, I'm, I love where I am. I love the work I'm doing. My mom started a daycare business in her home and she, she loves to play with the little kids and help create a better next generation. My, my sister worked on her bachelor's and her master's. So it sounds like, oh, it's a happy ending, but it was so painful like horribly painful in between of all the things we had to go through, like even simple things like my mom passing the driving test. She had to fail it like five times. And every time she's failing it, her, her self-worth is going lower and lower and lower and uh, constant fear for our existence and constant fear of uh, what if my dad makes it to the U.S.? We had three pepper sprays and we would every time we would walk our, into our home, we would be holding the pepper sprays, checking inside of the apartment. We lived in that apartment, the three of us, the one bedroom apartment for over two years because we couldn't afford anything else. So it required a lot of sacrifices. So when we talk about taking risks and driving change and transforming, it doesn't, it, it's not as glamorous initially, but at the end is so powerful when we connect with who we are and we realize uh, that we have a bigger purpose, a bigger 
life is so much more meaningful than to stay in golden cages because that's where we were. I was married to a jeweler. I was surrounded with gold and diamonds all day, but that was a gold cage. And I, it was, it, I just, it could not have, I could not have survived in it. Wow. Wow. That, that is powerful. Um, so, okay. So I want to, I want to keep going a little bit. Um, I want to talk about when you, um, got your master's and then I believe you said after that, that's when you went to work for IBM. Is that, is that the correct, uh, chronology? Mm -hmm. Um, so can you talk about what your role was at IBM and, and, um, kind of the, I guess the chronology of, of when you started until when you left and, and what you learned and how you developed as a person at, at that right. position? Okay. And I'll start a little before. So after I started my master's at the university of San Diego, I, uh, I was taking a class with a professor. His name is Dr. Starling. And Dr. Starling was, uh, the, he started an, um, a student organization within, within uh, the School of Business focused on uh, supply chain management. And at that time, he just kept reaching out to me and asking me to be the president of the student organization. So to me, that is hilarious because I was working full time, going to school, having to deal with the pain that my mom, my sister and I, we were living with, trying to survive. And this person is asking me to be the president. It's it just it didn't make sense. So I kept saying, no, I can't like I, I just don't have the time. And of course, I didn't see myself as a leader. I saw myself as a follower. I'm a person who who just does what people tell her to do. Like I, you do your homework, you clean, you cook, you, I just do that. <laughs> um, but he kept insisting. And until today, I don't know why he was insisting. And I finally wanted to just have him stop asking me. And I said, sure, I'll run. And in my head, I assumed that my students, my classmates would just not vote for me. Why would they vote for me? I have, I had no leadership skills. Uh, to my surprise, I got elected to be the president of the student organization. And that was, that's when my leadership journey started. And I didn't realize it at that moment where something, he saw something in me that I didn't even realize in myself. And without that, my whole journey would be extremely different. So that is like one thing which is so powerful, like seeing potential in people when they don't even realize it. Uh, then as I was being the president, I decided to start, start applying for uh, companies that came on campus. So IBM and Raytheon and uh, Intuit and all kinds of companies that I applied for. And I was shocked to realize that every single one of them gave me an offer. And uh, like some of them, like IBM and Raytheon, they were both offers were for a leadership development program. It's a two year program where we get to rotate four different places for teams. And those are the individuals that they select to be the future leaders for the company. So for IBM, they only select like eight people a year for that program. And I was one of the eight people out of all of U.S., I just could not believe it. And um, and I was questioning, like, am I, am I, like, they don't know. If they know really how broken and lost I am, they would not select me for this. And I had tons of fears. A big part of the fear was that I had to leave San Diego and move to New York and Connecticut for my first assignment. And, um, and it was hard because my mom and my sister, that was like three years after they moved and things were still fresh. And I had to make a decision. I either stay and I continue to take care of them and I continue to live, like to survive, or I give myself this chance and move to a whole different area and start my own individual, like personal discovery, because I never had time of knowing who I was away from the culture and the community. After I left, so I got married young. After I left, like a couple of months, my mom and sister came. So there was like layers and layers of uh, fear and insecurity. So I decided to accept the job with IBM. And I'm so glad I did. Uh, so, of course, I had to continue to take care of my mom and sister remotely. I had to ensure that they're okay. I had to fly to San Diego. Like anytime there's a uh, doctor visits or it, I, I had to continue to do things, which was absolutely fine. But then it gave me the opportunity to discover me away from family, away from everybody. And that is the best way to discover who we are when we take ourselves away from uh, the comfort zone. Uh, away from the expectations from people that are familiar to us 
up and just put ourselves in a whole different situation. And that's what I what happened. And with IBM, I started, I worked uh, in Connecticut and in New York um, for the initial assignment. And it was just uh, initially five months. Then I moved to work in North Carolina. In North Carolina, I worked in operations. And then uh, my third assignment was as part of the consulting team for IBM. So I worked for clients, IBM clients. I worked in Pittsburgh and also in uh, Chicago. And then my fourth assignment was back in uh in Raleigh, and it was in supply chain management. Um, and after that, I got to, I was asked to move to Japan. I got to live in Tokyo for IBM for over a year. I was doing like operation management. I was doing a lot of the communication between the US and the Japan team. I got to climb Mount Fuji. And that was a whole new experience of more self-discovery as well. Because here I was away from the culture that I got comfortable with, which was the US. And now I moved to a whole different culture, a culture that women, many cases, they don't have a voice. It's very male dominated. And here I was trying to re, uh, rediscover myself in that culture. And it triggered a lot of past memories. So even though I was in Japan, but it brought a lot of memories of me being in Jordan, of how I, I was observing uh, women and men, how they were treated. Um, but that that was absolutely amazing. I moved back to the U.S. and I got to work with three vice presidents for IBM that have over 10,000 people that report to them. And I was responsible with their strategy, helping them with their communication around the world. Um, and then I got to have my own lead, a team that I got to lead. So I had I was leading a global team. So it was like constant leadership and mentorship and uh, discovering who I am. But then as I was working with all of these amazing teams globally, I realized that same messages I was hearing of people putting themselves down and thinking that they're not good enough and worried of how people, others are going to perceive them and want to be perfect. It just, it just seems that we're born with all of these things. And it's initially, I thought it's just me because of my upbringing and my culture and my base. But then I was shocked to realize that almost everybody I was working with, they had their own vase. They had their own challenges and insecurities that they were living with. And as a result, it's stopping them, stopping them from for asking for a promotion, stopping them from moving to a new job, stopping them from speaking up, from presenting, from, from really saying who they are. And they were haunted by fear. So when we talk about the personal and the business, there's no separation. When we are living in fear personally, when we have low self-worth personally, we're bringing that to the business. And uh, I started mentoring and coaching and helping these people in their journey um, to a point that I got to a point where I was like, wow, I want to do more and more of this. Um, and that's when I moved to Louisiana. I moved to Louisiana with IBM also to uh, start a technology center in Baton Rouge. But my role was the talent development. I was responsible for all the training and the getting these new hires ready to work with customers, helping them with their soft skills and their uh, their um, presentation style and how, how they present themselves. And I, the more I did that, uh, the more I loved it. And that's the time when I started. Um, so that by that time, it was 2014. And that's when I gave my TEDx about my story with shattering the vase. And I had a lot of issues with this TEDx. Like people watch it and they tell me, oh, you look so confident. You look so calm. Well, I was a mess because I didn't want to talk about my story. I wanted to talk about everything else. I'm not used at that time to talk about my story and share it. There is so much shame related, like internal. Like I brought shame to my father and my family. And even though it is, it is it wasn't fair and it wasn't okay what I experienced, but I still was living with those uh, internal uh, guilt and fears and all of this. So I wrote my first TEDx and it was about working in a global environment and I got it approved, but then it just didn't feel right. So my intuition, my intuition kept saying like, no, this is not it. So I wrote a second one and it was about body language and how to work uh, like funny things about body language across cultures. And I got it approved. But then still my intuition was like, no. And then I wrote a third one. And the third one was about 
the leadership transformation that uh, an individual has to go through as we're working in a global environment. And it requires a lot of personal reflection and understanding and connecting with our stories. So as I was working on that, a friend of mine told me, well, maybe you need to uh, you need to talk about your vase story. And I shared it with her as a friend. And I'm like, no, like I'm not going to stand on a stage in front of 400 people and talk about my vase. And she just kept insisting. And we kept talking about it like daily for weeks. And I ended up giving my vase story. And I was so shocked with the reaction afterwards. Like companies would reach out and wanting me to speak to their employees, conferences. And it became so difficult to be able to do it. Uh, to do all of that, which was putting me at a high and I'm feeling so excited and energized while I have to do uh, have a full time job that was extremely demanding. And that's when I got to a point where I decided to resign and start my own company. And that's what I do. So it's been two years since I resigned from IBM. I had an amazing journey with them. It, it really gave me the foundation for everything I'm doing right now. All the training, all the keynotes, all the coaching. I got the experience with one of the best companies, with the best executives. And now I'm using it to help people transform and help them discover their potential and shatter their limitations and identify their base and shatter the hell out of that base. <laughs> That is awesome. That's fantastic. And, you know, for just so you know, I've actually seen your TED Talk a couple of times and it's fantastic. And everybody that's watching, I highly encourage you to go check out uh, Dima's um, TEDx Talk because it's fantastic. Um, so, so I want to talk a little bit about that transition from working at IBM to going out on your own and starting your own business because mm -hmm. – it, it, it's tough. <laughs> I'm not, not going to sugarcoat it. Running your own business is definitely difficult. So can you talk about the transition and how you made that switch and, and what it really looked like both externally and internally? It was hard. It was so hard because my identity was Dima the IBMer. And I... Um, and like when I introduce myself, hi, I'm Dima, I'm, I'm with IBM. And that gives a certain brand image for me. And my identity became Dima, the IBMer. So initially, when you think of my identity, Dima, the person who is part of the family, who is uh, like my family name was my identity. And then my marriage became my identity. And then my work became my identity. And that was the first time ever that I had to stop and I'm like, wow, like, who am I? Um, after I left IBM, I took a couple of months. Just, I didn't do much. I went to some conferences. I went to visit uh, family, like in my family, my mom and sister in San Diego. But then when I came back, I had no job because I left and I didn't have, I wasn't on vacation. And, and I remember sitting on the couch and I'm like, wow, like, who am I now? And, uh, and it, it is so powerful to ask ourselves these questions. Many times we link our identity with our family, with our spouse, with our children, with our work. But we don't realize that if we take all of those, peel them out, who are we? And that's a journey I had to go through for months. I remember that day that I mentioned when I came back from vacation. I, I, it was so difficult for me to even recognize who I am anymore that I put shut down my computer and I watched two movies. I'm like, I'm, I'm just going to escape. I just watched movies. One of them is called The Celestine Prophecy. If you didn't watch it, it's pretty cool. It is, it's very deep and it helps us understand. Um, it's like very spiritual thinking. And I think I needed, I needed to watch that. So for months after, I had to start creating a new brand and identify... Who, who am I outside of all of these external factors, outside of all of these strong brands that I've been attaching myself to? And uh, it was a journey. It was, it was, it's not easy, but it is so powerful of really stopping and asking these questions. And of course, building the brand for my company and what, how am I different? Who's my audience? Um, like, why should they listen to me? Why am I doing this? And just saying, following my purpose, that's not enough. It has to be deeper than that. Um, and discovering myself as Dima, the entre uh, entrepreneur, like I, I knew myself Dima as the wife, as the daughter, as Dima, as the employee, but now I'm on my own and I have to 
make peace with money and attract money into my life, which that by itself was a, a, a big journey, a big challenge. I'm used to money coming to me as a salary, and now I have to go out and and demonstrate my value and attract money into my life. So uh, it is still a journey. I'm still, this is my new transformation right now, which is the monetizing and understanding uh, how I fit in this world, the value I'm bringing for people to want to invest in, want to follow, want to listen to. Uh, so yeah, I'm in the middle of this uh, transformation and it is not easy, but I know as I'm going through it, it's going to be so much powerful. Because when we talk about empowering an individual, I used to think it is with education and with being having a strong, powerful job. Really, no. It is in addition to that. It's more. It is financial independence. It is knowing how to sell ourselves and uh, defining our value. When we understand our value, when we're able to have a market for companies and individuals that want our service, that escalates our self-worth and that that creates even so much more value for everybody around us so that is the the transformation that i'm going through right now so there's it never ends and when we shatter one vase another one appears it's not one time there's multiple vases that we have to go through as part of our evolution and um, i'm thankful for it it's not easy but i'm i'm going through it whether i like it or not i call it the choiceless choice we have to continue to make choices, even though they we would prefer to be safe and comfortable. But there's always something bigger than us pushing us to, to take these choices. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, I, I want to talk about uh, just a few more things. Um, you know, I really do appreciate your time. I can only imagine how busy you must be. Um, but you recently had some very, very exciting news. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil it for you, but, uh, maybe you could tell us about, uh, the very, very exciting, uh, accomplishment that you had recently. Yes. So it is right here. It is, uh, my new book that was just launched last week on Amazon Kindle. It's called Breaking Bases. If you look at the book cover, it has the, uh, Arabic calligraphy. And this Arabic calligraphy is the phrase I mentioned to you earlier. Knowledge is light and ignorance is darkness. But I, put, I took only the knowledge. So knowledge um, is light. So this is light. I wanted a, a cover that represents Middle Eastern feel and an American feel too. And a sense of transformation. So if you look, you'll be able to see the shards at the bottom. You'll be able to see like the, the cleanness, a sense of hope, um, we used a lot of the calligraphy inside of the book as well. So if I look here, let's see, we have, it's made of three parts. The first part of the book, so you see here, so we use a lot of the calligraphy inside as well. Uh, so the first part of the book is mainly the upbringing of me being in the Middle East and the story of the vase, the story of other, other stories that I got and the culture, the community that I was living in, not, not just the bad things. I talk a lot about the beautiful things that I love in the Middle East. I love our food. I love our music. Um, uh, even in the Ramadan, the Islamic holy month, the, there's certain things that happen that I love that I describe in the book. What we do in the holidays for Christmas, for Easter, like the very traditional things um, that are just wonderful. I describe them in the book. But I also talk about the, the vase that I had to live with. And I talk about my relationship with my dad since I'm a little girl and also the vase that he's living with. Because just the fact that my dad wanted to sacrifice his own daughter and wife and the other daughter for, for the sake of his name and reputation, that tells you that he's living with a major vase. That tells you that he's disconnected from his own identity, from the sense of love and compassion. And that is not, that is not good. So I describe that in the book. The second part, I talk about the marriage and the move to the U.S., the culture shock, uh, how the dynamics of the relationship within the marriage, um, all, all of these things that are like the, the awakening, how I started questioning things. That goes in part number two. And then part and that I left, that's part of two. Part three is the after I left, surviving, um, the death threats, my mom and my sister's move, then of course my education, my, my work with IBM, that I have a whole chapter about climbing Mount Fuji 
and the lessons in leadership that I got from climbing the mountain, which is so much fun, well, painful at that time, but now it's fun thinking about it. <laughs> um, and then I talk about the TEDx and the transformation I had to go through of allowing myself to share the story, to tell people about the journey that I had to go through and to deal with the healing and the shame that I initially had to experience. Um, and of course, I talk about the resigning from IBM and starting my journey and what I'm doing now. But I also mentioned other stories related to like my, my nephew when he was, I have a nephew, my sister uh, has a son. And he, when he was three years old, he came to visit with my sister. They live in San Diego and they came to visit me in Baton Rouge. And the uh, first thing he did when he got to my home, it was the first time he got on a plane. So the guy was so hyper and he was just so much energy. So he got to my home, he ran to the coffee. I have a coffee table and it has a ball that has shards in it. And it's from the various vases that I shattered. So he ran there and he picked the ball and he looked at it thinking that I'm totally crazy. Like who puts a ball with broken glass? And he said, Dima, what, what is this? And I, I had a moment where I had to stop and really it, uh, it was a big shock for me because what would I answer him? Would I tell him that your auntie is crazy? Like I like to collect broken glass and I put it as decoration in my home. Or would I tell him that because of these shards, you're alive today? Because of them, you we're able to give you a better life, a better future. You don't have to live with the vase and the expectations. Because of them, your mom is healthy and in, is safe in the U.S. Because of them, your grandmother is healthy and safe. Because of them, I'm here with you as well. So the beauty is in the shards. And when we shatter these vases, when we give ourselves permission to create a better life for us, when we're sacrificing the norm, that's when we are allowing the best, the new generation to have a better life. We're creating it for them. And that's a legacy. That's a difference that we need to look into making more of it instead of just passing one story of negativity to the next generation. Like if I imagine if I stayed in that marriage and I had a daughter, I wonder if I would have told her about the glass vase story. I wonder if I would have expected that from her. I, want, I wonder how the whole dynamic would be. Would I be empowering and tell her shatter it? Or would I be scared for her and expect her to keep it perfect? Most likely I would have her have her keep it perfect. And then I would have passed the same story from one generation to another and hurt the next generation. But now I just tell them to shatter the vase and to see the beauty in the cracks because our identity, our beauty is our weaknesses, our uh, pains, our, our uh, brokenness. That's what makes us unique. This is what this is our strengths. And in many situations, we ignore it and we we want to hide it because we want to keep an image of perfection. But we're hiding the beauty. We are hiding our value instead of making it so valuable and showing it to the world. Wow. Wow. That, that's incredible. Um, so. Yeah, I definitely highly encourage everybody to go pick up a copy of the book. I myself have gotten a copy, um, and uh, you know you will not be disappointed. <laughs> so uh, good. Yeah. Good. So. So yeah, um, on Amazon Kindle, it's available now. Uh, if it's on the uh, e-copy, but if you want the physical copy, you can uh, pre-order it on my website, which is breaking the book website breakingvases.com. The books, they're currently in print. I printed 400 copies so far, just initial. Um, so if anybody wants the physical copy, you can get it on my website, uh, breakingvases.com, and I should have them shipped in the next uh, 10 days. Fantastic, fantastic. So again, congratulations on becoming an international best-selling author. That is amazing and incredible. Um, very, very happy for you. Um, and, you know, I do, again, want to thank you so much for your time on this interview today. I have one more question for you, yeah. um, and, and that is, is there anything about yourself that you think is an important part of who you are that I did not ask you about today? In other words, what did I miss? Hmm. Um, what? Wow. Okay. What you missed is that everything I do is driven by purpose. Everything I do is like I invest so much in my growth. I invest, I continue to question, and I feel that it's not about me. My story is not about me. My story is about everybody who's going to 
listen to the TEDx or who's going to read the book and feel that they, they're inspired to take action in their life. Um, so I think that's what we, we didn't talk about. We've been talking about me and my journey. But as I wrote the book and as I continue to reflect, I realize that it's bigger than me. I'm just, in a way, the body that is sharing the story. But each one of us, we have a vase to shatter. And I'm just hoping that my story is going to continue to inspire other people to take action in their life, to to invest in themselves, to discover their voice, to connect with their with their intuition and their purpose and to continue to make a change in their life and for the next generation as well. Wow, that's incredible. Um, so again, Dima, I want to thank you so much for jumping on the interview today. It has been an absolute pleasure. Um, so, you know, everybody, I want to thank you for, uh, for, for tuning in and, and for always listening. Um, you know, I love you guys and, and thank you so much for all the support uh, week after week. Uh, but today we've been talking with Dima Gowie from Jordan. Have a fantastic, fantastic day. Thank you.